sitting aboard a Soyuz spacecraft perched 160 feet above a Soyuz booster and ready to launch less than an hour from now at 8.57 a.m. Central Time, 6.57 p.m. in the evening over in Baikonur. Right now we're going to get you a live view or we'll get it to you very soon. You can see in the top right of that board and they're sitting on a Soyuz rocket on site number one, the launch pad in Baikonur. That's the historic 1961 launch site of Yuri Gagarin, the first human to ever travel into space. This is going to be the last launch of a crew from Gagarin's launch pad for the next couple of months while engineers down there renovate Site 1 for future crewed launches on an upgraded Soyuz 2.1A booster. And that actually made its first flight with an uncrewed Soyuz uh, a little bit later or a little bit earlier this summer, traveling all the way up to the International Space Station and back down to Kazakhstan. The next Soyuz launch to the station in spring of 2020 is going to be the first crewed flight on that Soyuz 2.1A booster, and that's going to be launching from Site 31 down in Baikonur. Today, though, a team of launch controllers are watching over the systems aboard the rocket, which at this very moment is fully fueled and ready for launch, not tracking any issues so far throughout the day. And that day began with fuel and oxidizer loading all the way back at 5.52 a.m. Central Time, 3.52 p.m. in the afternoon out at the launch site in Baikonur. And that was completed just about two hours later. I do want to say good morning and welcome you here to Mission Control Houston. I'm NASA's Dan Hewitt, and I'm going to be taking you through today's launch and all of the subsequent phases as the Soyuz arrives at the International Space Station a little bit later this evening. And again, we're going to be here in the International Space Station flight control room where the team's going to be watching over the Expedition 60 crew and all the station systems, and they're going to be preparing to support the arrival of the Soyuz MS-15 vehicle. Station population is going to increase from six all the way up to nine with the addition of our three new crew members. It's NASA astronaut Jessica Mira over there on the right. In the middle is Russian cosmonaut Alex Gropochka. He's the commander of the Soyuz mission today. And on the left there is Haza Ali Amansuri. And he's an astronaut from the United Arab Emirates and a space flight participant making a short taxi flight up to the station. Once they arrive, it's going to mark the largest the station crew has been since September of 2015, when we actually had nine crew members on board during a seven-day period during Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko's year-long mission. Uh, these three are about to begin a planned four-orbit flight to the International Space Station, set to dock at approximately six hours after launch at 2.45 p.m. Central Time t uh, today, or uh, 12.45 in the morning on September 25th. Thursday over there in Baikonur where uh, their colleagues, friends, and family members of the Soyuz crew are going to be watching the events unfold right now standing out uh, at a site just about a mile away from the launch pad ready to watch them ride into orbit. The spacecraft is going to be docking with the Russian segment. It's actually going to go to the very back of the station to the aft port of what's known as the Zvezda module. You can see it in the lower right uh, of the station here on this shot. It's that Soyuz MS-15. And they're going to be joining the current station residents on board. There's some NASA astronauts, uh, Christina Cook and Nick Haig, and Russian cosmonaut and space station commander Alexei Ovchinin. They arrived aboard the Soyuz MS-12 spacecraft back in February. Also on board, NASA astronaut Drew Morgan and Russian cosmonaut Alexander Skortsov, and then European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano. Those three have been on board since July. Parmitano, who's in the top left of that picture there, is going to be taking over as the Expedition 61 commander on October 3rd when Haig of Chinon and Al Mansuri undock and make the trip back home aboard the Soyuz MS-12 vehicle. For now, though, here in Houston, the team in Mission Control are going to be monitoring today's launch, getting updates on the flight from the ground to the station from their Russian counterparts, and it's going to be Flight Director Ed Van Zeiss. You can see a few more people in the room than normal. Uh, the gentleman standing up there is Royce Renfrew, the outgoing Orbit One Flight Director. On the very bottom is Ed Van Zeiss in the blue shirt. He's going to be uh, the Flight Director for this trip today. And just above them, in the red, that's Don Pettit, the offgoing Capcom, and Diane Daly, the NASA Capcom for Orbit too. We should be hearing her voice a little bit later this evening. During the Soyuz's climb to orbit, tracking and telemetry is going to be downlink to ground stations along the flight path and then actually routed over to the Russian Mission Control Center. We're getting a live view from a camera right here that's located just outside of Moscow. 
One quick fun note, though, we are going to try and stop and take a few questions during today's launch broadcast, but also during the phases a little bit later when we get to the docking and the hatch opening show. So if you have any questions you want to ask, go ahead and hop onto Twitter and use that hashtag AskNASA. We'll try to get through as many of those as we can. Today's launch actually marks the first flight into space for NASA astronaut Jessica Mir and the first for uh, spaceflight participant Haza Al Ali Al-Mansuri of the United Arab Emirates. And this is actually the third flight for a Russian cosmonaut uh, and Soyuz MS-15 commander Alex Kropochka. For now, why don't we get to know our crew a little bit better? We'll start off with Jess Kamir, NASA's next astronaut to fly into space. The thing that's always driven and excited me is exploration in general. So I think I've always been attracted to these extreme environments, places where fewer people have been, where conditions are a little bit more harsh, a little bit more rare, and really extreme in general. I went to the Antarctic five times. Four times was for my PhD research. And the work that we were pursuing then in the Antarctic was looking at the diving physiology of emperor penguins they use this really big drill to create a hole in the ice. And so you enter the water through that hole in the ice. The first time you go diving through the sea ice hole, you really never forget the feeling. The water down there is a constant negative two Celsius, so 28 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see rays of light coming in from any crack or hole anywhere around the area. And that's where you start realizing all of the color and the beauty in the Antarctic is. It's just an extraordinary experience. And the things that I saw underwater there is definitely the most remarkable and exceptional diving I've ever had. One of the things that we use for training for spaceflight for astronauts from all of our partner agencies is training in analogs. So if you try to think, what, what are useful training platforms on the Earth? How do we replicate all of the characteristics of a space mission? One of the analogs that the European Space Agency developed is called CAVES, and it's a technical caving mission. So the CAVES training mission was in this very extraordinary cave in Sardinia. So you would sometimes be crawling through a hole that when you see it in the distance, you don't think there's no way that you could even fit through that. You know, one at a time, we would take off our packs and sort of shimmy like a snake through these tiny, tiny little holes. And then all of a sudden, you would come out into this room, this cathedral with a hundred meter granite wall. I mean, it was really just extraordinary. And, and then we would go on daily excursions, doing scientific experiments, exploring, mapping the cave. So all really similar things that we would do when we finally get to the point of exploring another planet, for example, as astronauts. And then also emphasizing all the other skills that we use on the International Space Station. The other connection that's really important to me is that all of these environments involve natural phenomenon on our planet. So it all goes back to my interest in biology, looking at this remarkable diversity in the animal kingdom with my previous research, exploring all of these amazing landscapes and ecosystems on our planet. And then eventually when I have the most extraordinary of any view, when I'll be on the space station in a couple months, looking down and seeing this magnificent planet Earth and seeing the beauty of our planet and really understanding how special it is and how fragile it is and how important it is to protect it, to take good care of our home planet, to protect our oceans, to protect the land, and to be really a good steward in our universe. I'm Jessica Meir. I'm a scientist and a NASA astronaut. Born and raised in Caribou, Maine, NASA astronaut Jessica Meir holds a Bachelor of Arts in Biology from Brown University, a Master of Science in Space Studies from the International Space University, and a Doctorate in Marine Biology from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. From 2000 to 2003, Dr. Meir worked for Lockheed Martin's Human Research Facility, supporting human physiology research on the Space Shuttle and International Space Station at NASA's Johnson Space Center. During this time, she also participated in research flights on NASA's reduced gravity aircraft and served as an Aquanaut crew member, 
in the Aquarius Underwater Habitat for the fourth NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, or NEMO, mission. Afterward, Mir's research focused on the physiology of animals in extreme environments, with her PhD research studying oxygen depletion in diving emperor penguins in the Antarctic and in diving elephant seals in Northern California. And then her postdoctoral research at the University of British Columbia investigated the high-flying bar-headed goose by training geese to fly in a wind tunnel while obtaining measurements in reduced oxygen conditions. In 2012, Dr. Meir accepted a position at the Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital, where she continued her research on the physiology of animals in extreme environments. She also took part in Smithsonian Institution diving expeditions to the Antarctic and Belize. Selected in 2013 to become an astronaut as part of NASA's 21st astronaut class, Mir completed her training in 2015. She'll be in familiar company when she arrives at the station, joining three of her former astronaut classmates, current station residents Nick Haig, Christina Cook, and Drew Morgan. And that was a little bit more about Jessica Mir, the NASA astronaut flying today. She's going to be seated to the left of the Soyuz commander and the Russian cosmonaut on today's flight. Roscosmos cosmonaut Oleg Skripochka is returning to space for the third time today. Born in Novinomysk, Russia, Skripochka was a member of the Young Cosmonauts Group while he was a student at Zaporozh Physics and Mathematics High School number 28, graduating in 1987. Afterward, he attended Bauman State Technical University, and while an undergraduate, he obtained work experience at the Russian Space Corporation Energia as a test subject and as a mechanic in the project department, graduating in 1993 with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering with a specialization in rocket engineering. Skropochka worked at RSC Energia from 1993 to 1997 as an engineer at the Transport and Cargo Vehicles Ground Hardware Development and Testing Project Department. Oleg is also a first-class skydiver with over 300 parachute jumps. Selected in July of 1997 as an RSC Energia cosmonaut candidate, Skropochka completed basic spaceflight training at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in 1999 qualifying as a test cosmonaut. His first trip into space was in October of 2010 as a flight engineer during Space Station Expeditions 25 and 26, and while aboard, he performed two spacewalks. His second flight began in March of 2016 on Soyuz TMA-20M as part of the Space Station Expeditions 47 and 48, during which he completed his third spacewalk. To date, Skarpochka's cumulative spacewalking total is 16 hours and 41 minutes spent outside the space station. Skarpochka is serving as the Soyuz MS-15 commander and will serve aboard the International Space Station as an Expedition 61 flight engineer and later as the Expedition 62 commander. Seated to his right is first-time flyer, United Arab Emirates spaceflight participant Haza Ali Al-Mansuri. Born in al wathab and spending his early years living and going to school in Al-Dafra in western Abu Dhabi, Al-Mansuri's passion for astronomy led him to join the armed forces and later become a military pilot. He became a functional check flight pilot for the F-16B-60 and spent three years training on this aircraft in the United States in Arizona. Afterward, he returned to the UAE to complete his training. Four years after his return, Hazah became the youngest Emirati military F-16 pilot, qualifying to be a flight testing and aircraft assessment pilot. The UAE astronaut program launched in 2017 to train and prepare a team of Emirati astronauts and send them to space for various scientific missions. Following a series of mental and physical tests in the UAE and abroad, Al-Mansuri was selected from a field of over 4,000 candidates. In September 2018, Almansuri started training with the Russian space agency Roscosmos at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia. He will be the very first member of the UAE astronaut program to fly into space.
And this is some recorded video from a little bit earlier today as the three crew members got prepared, woke up in the Cosmonaut Hotel and got ready to make their way out to the launch site. Uh, the crews were woken up at about 11.57 p.m. Tuesday night central time, 9.57 a.m. in the morning over in Baikonur, which is about nine hours prior to the launch. They participated in all of their final pre-launch activities, and all that begins at crew quarters. Uh, what you're seeing here is a pretty old tradition of before departing for the launch pad, the crew members uh, go through a ritual of autographing some of the doors on the rooms that they occupied at the Cosmonaut Hotel in Baikonur. You can see just one set aside here, all three crew members getting a chance to sign their names, and all those other signatures are from crew members, uh, both NASA Rose Cosmos and all of the international partners from over the years. They also get a blessing here before they depart from a priest of the Russian Orthodox Church, who earlier in the week also takes time to go out and bless the rocket itself at the pad and the various pad workers and even some of the members of the media that will generally gather uh, to document these launches. Following that, they stroll out from the Cosmonaut Hotel down a line, uh, down a sidewalk lined with friends, family, uh, well-wishers, program officials from uh, the various space agencies before they make their way onto a bus. And uh, this is uh, one of the last of several times that they get a chance to see all of these folks before they load into the rocket. Uh, they walk out to a traditional song that's played every single time. And the Russian name for it escapes me at this moment. Uh, but a lot of tradition surrounding all of these launches in Baikonur as they have again been launching from this area since the 60s when Gagarin made that first leap into space. So for the prime crew, it's onto one bus, the purple one here, and then the backup crew follows behind in another large bus. They're accompanied by uh, a lot of the flight surgeons and doctors. Again, you can see a large mass of people there gathered outside of the Cosmonaut Hotel. Uh, this all taking place a little bit earlier this morning at about 2.57 a.m. Central Time, 12.57 p.m over in Baikonur. It's about a 40 minute ride from this hotel actually onto the Cosmodrome itself where they head over to what's known as building 254 inside the Cosmodrome and that's the integration and pseudo facility. So getting a chance to wave a pose there from Huzzah. Again you can see a pretty large crowd gather there. NASA Public Affairs Officer Rob Navy is sneaking into view real quick there. Uh, but getting their first departure from this hotel. Again, it's about 40 minutes from the hotel onto the Cosmodrome. It's very sparse uh, area, uh, as obviously you're launching rockets, you don't want a lot in that area. It's a very vast and open Kazakh step. And then they arrive here in building 254. Once they get to the actual suit up in integration facility, it's time to get into these launch and entry suits. And this is called the Sokol. It's the white suit. You can see uh, Alex Gropochka getting into it here. Uh, this is worn throughout all the different dynamic phases of flight. So they're going to wear it for today's launch and the eventual docking with the International Space Station. Then the suits get put away and they get brought back out if they're ever flying in that Soyuz either for a relocation or when they actually come back down to Earth. And these suits just act uh, just like the large orange ones that you might remember from the shuttle era that astronauts wear. They're able to be pressurized and provide additional uh, breathing gases and a safe atmosphere for the crew members should the capsule itself become unpressurized. They also get a communications cap so they're able to not only speak with each other but also the flight controllers down on the ground who oversee their flight all the way up to the space station. There are several specialists. You'll see a lot of uh, individuals wearing uh, masks and other items as the crew are kept in a quarantine prior to their mission um, to help uh, reduce the chance of any uh, disease, infectious diseases or anything making its way up to the space station. They're kept in a strict quarantine for about two weeks prior to their flight. Very controlled access to the crew themselves uh, and then any not in, also in quarantine uh, like the backup crew. Uh, we'll have to go through some preventative measures, usually wearing masks or different protective gear. Uh, here you can see NASA's Jessica Mir also getting suited up. First, all three crew members get suited up, and then we'll see them move into another room where they actually do uh, some pressure checks on the spacesuits themselves. You can see Jessica Mir playing with the small blue knob. That actually uh, is used by the astronauts to control the pressure level inside of those suits. Mm -hmm. 
And the backup crew right behind them. Uh, Tom Arshburn on the right there in the blue suit. He's been the backup for the last two flights. The backup crew helping the uh, the prime crew get ready for their flight and they're also on deck to step in should the prime crew or any of the prime crew members not be able to make the trip. But again, after that initial suit up, they move over here and then they get into actually a mock-up of an actual Soyuz seat and they go through and take turns having their suits actually pressurized. So they'll, you'll see them close the visor and the suits themselves will actually start to puff up and that means they're being pressurized and filled with air. They do this to get a good leak check on the suit, make sure all of the seals are acting correctly. And this is one of the final steps before they actually make their way out to the rocket. You can see Alex Kropochka there in the seat, uh, his suit a little bit puffed up. That means it's going through that pressure check They do this again to make sure that their suits are free from leaks. This is also one of the, the final chances that the crew members get to speak to friends and family that have gathered. They're on the other side of this protective pane of glass, again, to help maintain that quarantine. And you'll see them one by one do the pressure check and then make their way over to the pane of glass where they're able to speak to friends and family and also program officials from their respective space agencies. So with Alex Kropochka's job done in the chair there, it was next up to Jessica Mir. You can see her, again, using that knob on the front of the suit to adjust the pressurization inside. You can see how it's, uh, it looks like it's been inflated, kind of like a balloon. That just means the suit's been pressurized and doing this to check. Again, those seals make sure no leaks in the suit as uh, these suits act as pretty much the last line of defense for the crew members if the capsule were to be unpressurized for any reason. There's Haza Ali Alman Suri, and he's the first United Arab Emirates astronaut set to fly into space. He'll be a spaceflight participant uh, on this trip. You might see that word used. Uh, that just differentiates him from an expedition crew member like uh, Oleg and uh, Jessica, who are going to be spending uh, several months on board the station. Alman Suri's first flight only going to last about eight days. Uh, but he'll have a schedule jam-packed of uh, a couple of different science experiments that he's going to be taking part in, uh, both U.S. and Russian, and, and also doing some uh, outreach uh, to his home country, the United Arab Emirates, while he's on board. <laughs> And again, with all three crew members able to go through those leak checks, they make their way over to the chairs, which have microphones in front of them. And this is, again, one of those last few chances for them to talk uh, to their family members uh, prior to making their way out to the actual launch pad. <laughs> For each flight, we have a new emblem. But I was thinking you would have a completely different theme for your new flight. Well, it's uh, a bit different. Uh, and the border is different too. Is this something special? No, this is our nominal gear. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
نشان میده Again, also joining friends and family, our program officials. You can see the delegation from the United Arab Emirates, and this Dimitri Rogozin, the head of Roscosmos. Everything is going according to plan. So, as usual, I wish you a successful launch and successful expedition, and then successful return to the ground. We know you and we are sure that you will find correct solutions for any situation. The main thing is for you to be a team and support one another. Showing us what we can do when we work together. And thank you for your service. When you get up there, down and see the world know the whole world's looking up there and thinking about you. Have a great time. Do a little bit of work, but have a great time while you're up there. And uh, we'll see you back here on the planet uh, when you come back for a soft landing. All the best. We are all proud of you, and we'll be, we, will, we will be with you in this mission. We hope you all the uh, good wish in this mission. And uh, thank for the backup crew also. You did a very good job. And we believe that all of you is prepared for this mission. I would like to thank also the two astronauts also, and uh, thank you for your support. And two of those last three to speak were Kirk Scheim, the International Space Station Program Manager, and Ken Bowersox, the NASA Acting Associate Administrator for Human Exploration Operations. But with that done, it was time to do the walkout. You can see the crew, and they you'll see that they're usually in this configuration with the commander in the middle, Jessica to his left, and Huzzah to his right. That is how they will actually be seated inside the Soyuz. So once the final suit up and pressure checks are done, they walk out of that suit up integration uh, facility and then once again make their way over to the bus. As you can see, again, a large crowd gathered to see them on their way. And at this point, they load back up into those same buses that took them from the Cosmonaut Hotel to this building to now head out to the pad. So they get a final opportunity to uh, wave farewell to friends and family and then make their way from Site 254, that integration building, over to the launch pad. They boarded that bus at about 5.57 a.m. Central Time, 3.57 p.m. Baikonur, heading over to launch pad number one, also known as Gagarin Start. That drive takes about 25 minutes. They arrived at the pad at about 6.22 a.m. Central Time, 4.22 p.m. in Baikonur. Once there, they're helped off the bus by, again, several officials, both from Roscosmos, uh, and also NASA and the United Arab Emirates Space Agency there in attendance with their first ever astronaut. Reporting to the panel, the crew is ready for flight. And again, you can see in the middle there, that's the head of Roscosmos, Dmitry Rogozin. He's the one uh, on the on Oleg's left, helping Skripochi get to the pad, traditional for uh, the different managers to help the crew members the last leg of their journey into the actual rocket itself. They'll lead them over to a stairway where the crews will get up, do one final wave, and then ride up the elevator to the top of the Soyuz booster to board their capsule, which they've actually been aboard now for about two hours. So you can see them one at a time going up the stairway, the final uh, pad integration engineers will be waiting for them at the top to make the elevator ride up. And for now, they are inside the Soyuz rocket. Be careful here. Wave your hand carefully. Turn around.
And with that, we are back to a live view, getting your first view now of the Soyuz spacecraft out there on the launch pad at the Baikonur Cosmodrome right now. Right now we are 27 minutes, 22 seconds and counting away from the planned launch today of these three crew members heading to the International Space Station. Again, that liftoff scheduled for 8.57 a.m. Central Time, 6.57 p.m. in the evening over there in Baikonur. And again, we're going to be taking your questions on Twitter throughout the day's events. Again, just jump over and use the hashtag AskNASA. If you have a question about anything taking place, we'll go ahead and jump through a couple of them right now. Our first one comes from Jack, who wanted to know how many minutes does it take to dock with the space station? Well, the timeline right now has them again lifting off at 8.57 a.m. Central Time, and they are set to dock uh, later this evening at 7 Uh, at 2.45 p.m. Sorry, doing some quick time zone calculations in my head. Uh, but from there, it's about 5 hours and 48 minutes and 4 seconds per the timeline. So that translates to 348 minutes from launch to docking. Thanks for the question, Jack. Our next question comes from Miss Whitaker's science class. She wants to know, or they want to know, if each astronaut has their own bedroom. Uh, so there are currently six crew quarters aboard the International Space Station. You can think of that as their bedroom. They're about the size uh, of a phone booth or a very small closet, and uh, they have doors. There are four right now in Node 2, uh, the Harmony module, and also two over on the Russian segment, and that's what acts as the kind of crew members' bedrooms. I know a lot of people have been asking, well, where are the other people going to sleep? There are nine of them. Uh, they do have additional sleeping bags, and all of the crew sleeps on the same schedule, so lights can be turned off in some of the modules, and you'll just have different crew members in those modules for the short duration that we do have have nine crew members on board. Our next question comes from Renee, uh, who's asked, uh, in previous crew changes, a crew left before a new crew launch, uh, but now we're going to be extended to nine for over a week. Is this a one-time thing, or is this going to be standard? That's actually, uh, we're doing something that is known inside of the space industry as direct handover. So that's when you have a vehicle arrive while there are still crew on board. It has been done in the past. It was uh, the common practice every single time when we only had three crew members aboard the station because you would have three new crew members arrive before the other three left to maintain that constant habitation, which again, if you've been keeping track, we've had people on board the International Space Station every single day since November 2nd of 2000. We're gonna be celebrating the 20th straight year of humans on board starting next year in 2020. Uh, and during then, these direct handovers were much more common. Uh, it's been a little bit more uncommon uh, since we went up to six, uh, where you have uh, one crew land and then another one launch. So you have a short period of time where you only have three crew members. Um, for now, though, we are going to be up to nine. Uh, it's possible you will see more of these direct handovers uh, once we start flying uh, new commercial vehicles, uh, also known as the commercial crew capsules, launching astronauts once again from the United States. And then we'll do one more for right now. This one comes from Matt, who wants to know what's the top speed in the G-Force the crew's going to experience. Or actually, this one's uh, from Chelsea. Sorry, how long is the crew going to be staying at the International Space Station once they arrive? Uh, thank you, Chelsea. It's going to be different for all of uh, these different crew members. Uh, for Haza Ali Al-Mansuri, he's only going to be up there for about nine days. He's set to come home uh, on October 3rd with two other crew members, NASA astronaut Nick Haig and Russian cosmonaut Alexei Ovchinin. Uh, for Jess Kamir and Alex Grapochka, they're going to be staying uh, up to about 200 days or a little bit over six months on board. They're going to be up there for a long duration. It's common for long duration expeditions to be about six months in length. Um, that's been the, uh, the common practice throughout the life of the International Space Station. You do have a couple of different or a couple of different durations sprinkled in there throughout. 
Uh, nowadays, or over about the last year, about 200 days is the common length, but some are even starting to surpass that. Uh, for example, NASA astronaut Christina Cook, uh, thanks to some seat swapping, is going to be staying on board the International Space Station over 300 days, uh, doing a very long duration mission. She's actually going to be setting the record for the longest single space flight by a female astronaut. Uh, and she's going to be getting very close to the U.S. record for a continuous space flight, which Scott Kelly set back during the year-long mission of 340 days. And one more for right now. This one does come from Matt. He wanted to know what's the top speed in G-Force the crew's going to experience. Uh, the ride uphill isn't two g-force intense they'll usually get up to about three g's on the ascent uh, but the eventual speed they're going to reach is that orbital velocity that's the uh, amount of speed they need to maintain an orbit or a circle around the earth and that'll eventually match up with that of the international space station which is right around 17,500 miles per hour Well, right now we are 21 minutes and counting away from the launch of these three crew members. Uh, Jess Kamir and her crewmates did describe the significance and the symbolism of their Soyuz MS-15 patch, uh, which you can see here during a recent crew news conference. Why don't we hear it from them in their own words? Um, well, there were some of the key feature features for the Soyuz patch are the Arctic turn, and this is the, a bird that makes an incredibly um, far-ranging duration. For me, it's extra special because in my previous life as a physiologist, I studied birds and some migrations of birds, so I really like that element of the patch. Mm -hmm. And of course, that long-duration flying bird represents our long-duration mission and how special that is. Um, Oh, yes. And also the colors, uh, the edge of uh, our batch is representing the, also uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, Apollo landing. Yes, the colors at the edge. Uh, and also, um, you can see also uh, a UA flag with my name in Arabic. That's in Arabic, so if you're just wondering what uh, it's written there. So it's my last name, Al-Mansouri. It's written in, in Arabic. And also this batch is also the same batch. Uh, flown the first time, Oleg, in, in his first mission, in the same design. Yes, reiterating Hazar's words, I wanted to show some continuity between my first flight. My first flight showed a stalk, and uh, my second also had a bird on it, and this time we have uh, this bird that Jessica mentioned. Also, we have a ship station that we're going to work on, then the moon, which is uh, our subsequent goal, as our next stage when flying in deep space, interstellar area. That's it, I think Jessica explained all of it, and Hazard too. Back right now with a live look at that Soyuz rocket on the pad. We are still counting down. We are 18 minutes, 30 seconds away from liftoff again, scheduled at 8.57 a.m. Central Time, 6.57 p.m. in the evening over there in Baikonur. The Soyuz rocket itself stands 162 feet tall, weighing in at 680,000 pounds, and consists of the Soyuz MS-15 spacecraft inside of a protective shroud up at the very top and the three-stage Soyuz FG booster below. The spacecraft itself was mated to the booster and the three main stages were joined together earlier this week on Sunday, 
And then just 24 hours later on Monday, the Soyuz rocket began its trek actually from that integration facility out to the pad, always opening the door and starting that trip right at 7 a.m. Baikonur time, arriving less than two hours later where it gets raised to its vertical position for final pre-launch preparations. It moves out on a rail car from that building out to the pad number one, and then these large clamshell gantry arms swing up to secure it in place and also offer access to the actual spacecraft including that elevator that the crew rides up to, uh, to board the Soyuz prior to launch. The first stage of the Soyuz rocket has four liquid, uh, liquid fueled engines that are strapped to the side of the core vehicle and each of those is going to burn uh, for about one minute and 58 seconds before they drop away. Uh, you can see those engines uh, in this uh, shot of that uh, video from a little bit uh, earlier this week. Uh, they're the, the small parts at the bottom that actually protrude out from the Soyuz spacecraft and we'll see them light up just a few seconds prior to the liftoff and begin carrying the Soyuz into orbit. Here's a quick animation of how this ride is going to look. So those engines will actually start firing for several seconds before liftoff. Eventually their power overwhelming the, uh, the grapple arms that are holding it in place. And they're actually only held in place by gravity. So once the thrust of the vehicle is strong enough, it will like, it'll make those break away and the Soyuz will leap away from the pad. Again, four strap-on liquid fuel boosters help power the first stage, and they burn for just about uh, 1 minute and 58 seconds. Uh, first, the escape tower will jettison, followed by those four uh, boosters. Depending on if it's a clear enough day, we may be able to get some video uh, making something called the Koryov Cross when they break away. The launch shroud, once the vehicle is high enough, will uh, depart. And then the uh, core stage continues burning until it's time for the third stage. Uh, that core stage serving as second, burning until 4 minutes 57 seconds into the flight. The third stage lights and actually starts firing before the second or the, before that first stage core stage drops away, something called a hot staging technique. And that'll continue to burn until about 8 minutes and 45 seconds in a flight. And then after that, it's time for vehicle separation. Soyuz will separate from the top of that third stage, and it will be flying free and ready to make its chase down of the International Space Station. We're still counting down, though. Right now, we are 15 minutes, 20 seconds away from liftoff. Atop the rocket, Jessica Mir, a NASA astronaut, Haza Ali Almansuri, the astronaut from the United Arab Emirates, and Alex Kropochka, the Russian cosmonaut, just strapped in and counting down. We're just coming up on 15 minutes. And again, a reminder, we are taking those questions. If you have any, hop over to Twitter and use that hashtag, AskNASA. We'll be using that. A we'll answer those questions throughout today's broadcast. We won't get as many today during this pre-launch, but we'll have plenty of time later on when we're in the docking and hatch opening shows. So be sure to keep on sending those in. Now, though, let's learn a little bit more about the Soyuz spacecraft itself which measures in at 23 and a half feet long, tipping the scales at 15,650 pounds. And the Soyuz itself, the spacecraft, is also comprised of three different modules. At the very top, you see the orbital in the middle of the descent where the crew actually is, and on the bottom, the propulsion module. The descent module is situated in the middle of the Soyuz vehicles that has a customized seat liner inside each of the seats for these crew members that they're seated in during launch, entry, and landing, and contains all of the different controls and displays necessary for the flight. It has life support systems, batteries for re-entry and landing. Also, the parachutes are tucked away right behind the crew members' heads. It also has soft landing rocket engines on the very bottom beneath the heat shield that fire to slow the Soyuz right before it touches down in Kazakhstan. There's also eight hydrogen peroxide thrusters located on the module that are used to control its orientation or its attitude uh, during the actual descent until parachute deploy deployment. It also has guidance, navigation, and control system to maneuver the vehicle during that descent phase of the mission. It weighs 6,393 pounds, has a habitable volume of about 141 cubic feet, so it's a bit of a tight fit. Just overhead and through a hatchway, though, is the orbital module at the very top. And this is the part that not only con connects to the descent module via a pressurized hatch, but is the part that will actually connect to the International Space Station. It's got a small amount of room for the crew to move around during the flight to station. It was 
much more important space when they were taking two days, which is still the default if there are any issues during that initial trip. Uh, but it has uh, about 230 cubic feet of space as the docking mechanism hatch, rendezvous antennas all at the very front end. And that docking mechanism, again, is what's actually used to connect this spacecraft to the International Space Station. And then the rendezvous antennas, which are on the very top, that are used by the automated docking system, uh, which actually use radar, will maneuver it towards the station for docking. There's also a forward-looking window on the module for the crew to take manual measurements of distance. All the way on the bottom of the spacecraft is the propulsion module that has all of the oxygen storage tanks, the main engine, the attitude control thrusters, avionics and communications and control equipment. Propulsion module, uh, propulsion portion uh, of the module handles all the orbital maneuvers, including those actually needed to rendezvous with the, with the International Space Station, but also perform the deorbit burn at the very end of the spacecraft's mission. And before they're deployed, the two solar arrays, which gather electrical energy for the systems on board, are folded against the body of the spacecraft. Uh, and those will actually unfold right after we get into orbit. Uh, the propulsion module itself, though, detaches during that final descent and burns up in the Earth's atmosphere along with the orbital module, that descent module, so that middle part, which has the heat shield, the only piece of the Soyuz that actually survives that fiery re-entry. And the entire spacecraft not only serving as a crew transport vehicle, so getting the crew up into space and then getting them back home at the end, also serves as basically their escape capsule. So these are used uh, in the event that they need to get off of the space station in a hurry for any reason. They use their Soyuz spacecraft as that emergency descent and landing. So there is always at least one Soyuz spacecraft for each of the three crew members on board, or rather there's at least a seat in a Soyuz at all times for any crew members on board the space station. We are 10 minutes and 42 seconds and counting down to launch. Representatives from NASA, Roscosmos, and the United Arab Emirates, along with friends, family, are all watching just a short distance away from the launch pad that we're getting a live look at right now over in Baikonur. For a quick update on all the activities there, why don't we go to Baikonur veteran and NASA Public Affairs Officer Rob Navius. Dan, it is sunset here in the Central Asian Desert, and the multinational crew strapped inside the Soyuz MS-15 spacecraft is set to begin its six-hour journey to the International Space Station. Fall is in the air here in Baikonur, with the start of this mission in the offing, as Skripochka, Mir, and Al-Mansuri are minutes away from blasting off in their Soyuz spacecraft in the final crewed launch of this year. After today's liftoff, the legendary Site 1, where Yuri Gagarin began his journey into the history books more than 58 years ago, will be temporarily closed for renovation and modernization to accommodate future human spaceflight launches of the Soyuz spacecraft on the upgraded 2.1A Soyuz booster. The NASA delegation for this launch is led by the acting administrator for human exploration, former astronaut Ken Bowersox. About a 1,000 people from the United Arab Emirates are here to watch their native son, Al-Mansuri, ride into their history books as the first Emirati citizen to fly in space. Against that backdrop, as we near the 19th anniversary of the start of a permanent human occupancy of the International Space Station, everything is in readiness for a ride into the sunset skies from this historic venue. That's it from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Now back to you at Mission Control in Houston. And thank you, Rob. Getting some in-cabin views now of the Soyuz. Uh, in this view, in the bottom right corner, you're seeing the center seat. That's Alex Kropochka. And then in the center of your screen, that is Haza Ali Al-Mansuri. He's seated in the right seat uh, for today's launch, making his first trip into space, the third for Skropochka. We're about eight and a half minutes away from the planned launch time. Why don't we sneak in a few more Ask NASA questions our first one uh, comes from Zyriel, who wanted to know, when's the last time nine people were aboard the International Space Station? Great question. Uh, it hasn't actually been that long. It was September of 2015 when there was a short taxi flight that brought up a Kazakh, uh, Ka Kazakh cosmonaut, uh, and that was during the one-year mission 
uh, for Scott Kelly uh, and me, Kyle Kornienko. So again, it was another really long duration flight, and we had a crew member going up for a short, we call it a taxi flight, um, just about an eight day mission. Our next question comes from Good Hope, who wanted to know, is there a possibility their flight path will be affected by the HTV-8 launch that just happened yesterday? No, it won't. Uh, this is something, as you can imagine, all of the different flight controllers look at very carefully. Uh, there's usually some constraints around when vehicles are arriving, but these won't be arriving at the same time. This Soyuz going to launch and dock today. Uh, the HTV-8 not set to actually get really close to the space station until Saturday. And then we'll do one more, this one from Cassidy, who wants to know, what do they eat? Well, Cassidy, they eat quite a bit of different things. Uh, each of the crew members, before they go up, uh, at least on the NASA side, get a chance to sit down with NASA food scientists to map out all of their likes and dislikes for their menu items. Uh, it's much more diverse of a, a menu than you might imagine, uh, getting everything from shrimp cocktail to different pork chops, uh, things of that nature, uh, food in space, not as you might imagine. Uh, they don't have the freeze-dried ice cream. Uh, we actually are able to send real ice cream sometimes, um, and most of their food not coming in tubes. It's dehydrated, and so it actually has, a, we call it a shelf-stable life, so it'll maintain taste and nutrition for up to two to three years. Right now, though, we are just under six and a half minutes away from launch. We have teams here in uh, Mission Control Houston standing by to monitor. They'll be um, much more involved once the vehicle actually approaches the space station. And then overseeing today's mission, uh, Mission Control Moscow out in Koryov. They're going to be talking directly to the crew during their flight up to orbit. And on the right there, a continuing look at a live view of the Soyuz rocket on the launch pad. We are just six minutes away. At this point, all of the pre-launch operations are complete. And the countdown, the first and second stage engines are ready for launch. They've confirmed that they've gotten telemetry from the rocket, indicating that all the primary and backup systems are ready to support. And we just heard the call that the launch key has been inserted in the launch bunker. That's probably one of the coolest things about one of these launches is they do use an actual key. And that transitions the launch sequence into its automatic mode. So we are T minus five minutes, 15 seconds away from launch. And at this point, the range at Baikonur has been cleared. The Soyuz rocket ready to begin its journey. Ground measurement system is activated by run one command. Combustion chamber nitrogen purge. We are T minus four minutes, 30 seconds at this point. Fuel lines, the combustion chamber being purged with nitrogen. So using a nitrogen gas to blow out any remaining vapors of fuel or oxidizer that may be in those fuel lines. At this point, the crew member have their helmets closed inside the cabin. They're strapped in and ready for launch. Uh, Sir Mat, how do you read me? How do you read me? It's loud and clear. Everything is fine on board. Copy. And you're hearing a translation between the commander, Alex Gropochka, uh, and the actual launch engineers there in Baikonur reporting everything good on board. The crew ready to go. Ground measurement system is activated by Run 2 command. Oxidizer and fuel drain and safety valves of launch vehicle are closed.
And just passing the three minute mark now away from launch. All the cockpit displays inside the Soyuz are lit up and ready for cosmonaut Alex Kropochka uh, to keep an eye on during today's flight. All the onboard systems are switched over to onboard control, continuing to march down two minutes, 40 seconds away from liftoff. We press. And keep an eye on the videos. Uh, you'll see two large umbilical towers or arms kind of connected to the rocket still. Uh, the taller one is the first umbilical tower. That'll separate the booster and that'll initiate auto sequence start. That coming right at around T minus 35 seconds. And when you see the smaller umbilical detach, it, that means we are 15 seconds away from launch. And T minus two minutes from launch. One minute, 30 seconds away. It does look like we have some cloud cover there in Baikonur, so you may see it disappear into the cloud deck pretty quickly. Uh, that first stage going to light up the night sky, though. It's going to burn uh, for the first several minutes uh, before those four strap-on boosters break away. Uh, at just about one minute and 58 seconds into the flight. One minute and counting. One minute to lift off contact. Copy. Everything is fine on board. We're feeling well, and we're ready for launch. Copy. We go to internal power. And you see that first umbilical separating. And now keep an eye on the one a little bit lower down. Once that separates, you know we're 15 seconds away from liftoff. Auto sequence initiated. Auto sequence start. Second umbilical separating. T minus 15 seconds. You can see the engine starting to fire. Second umbilical. The first stage ramping up. Engine turbo pumps at flight speed. Engines at maximum thrust. And lift off. Lift off. Oleg Skripochka, Jessica Mirhaza, Ali Almansuri leaping forth from Gagarin start on their way to the International Space Station. First and second stage thrusters are operating just fine. We copy. Everything is fine on board the Soyuz. We're feeling great. Copy. We're going to continue to get these translations throughout the flight. Everything's still sounding good with that first stage. You can see the four strap on boosters lighting up the night sky. So he's delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust with that first stage, the four boosters and the single core engine. You can see them punching through the cloud layer there. The first stage measures 68 feet in length, 24 feet in diameter, burning liquid fuel for the first two minutes of the flight. The flight. Pitch, your roll are nominal. It's a pitchy on roll referring to the orientation of the vehicle. Nominal, a word you'll hear a lot. That just means everything is proceeding normally. Continuing to get for good first stage uh, indicators from the Soyuz. Things looking good inside the cabin. You can see Jessica Mir at the top of your screen. Alex Kropochka at the bottom there in the commander seat. First and second stage thrusters are operating nominally. A little over a minute and a half into the flight. Everything continuing to go well with the Soyuz crew. They've already well exceeded over 1,100 miles an hour. The next things we're going to be looking for is the escape tower jettison. 
and then the first stage strap-on boosters separating. And they're getting a great view. You can see that Koryov cross, the first stage strap-on boosters have separated along with that tower. Now the core engine continuing to fire. The Soyuz already at an altitude of about 28 statute miles. Nominal, copy. Everything is nominal on board. We are feeling great, copy. So at this point, the Soyuz traveling in excess of 3,300 miles per hour. You can see those four strap-on boosters continuing to descend. The Soyuz powered now by that core stage engine. 160 seconds into the flight. Copy. Yes, we uh, see that the launch shroud jettison is also confirmed. Affirmative. The launch shroud protecting the Soyuz during that initial climb through the atmosphere has been jettisoned. This is actually a view from on, on the Soyuz spacecraft itself. You're looking down at one of the folded up solar arrays. We're over three minutes now inside the rocket's altitude, already 48 miles in height. At this point, traveling in excess of 4,700 miles per hour. 200 seconds into the flight. Second stage uh, thrusters are operating nominally. So everything continuing to go well with that core stage. The core stage booster of the Soyuz, 56 feet in length, 13 and a half feet in diameter, has a single engine with four fuel chambers, and it provides between 178,000 and 220,000 pounds of thrust, depending on the altitude, for its three minutes and 28 seconds of operation. This is going to continue to burn until about four minutes, 43 seconds into the flight, and Soyuz is going to use what's called a hot stage technique. Copy all. Everything is nominal on board. We're feeling great. Copy. Reports everyone doing well on board. Everything continuing to go well. Again, that hot stage technique will actually see the third stage start to fire while the second stage is still connected. It has a lattice-like structure between the two stages, allowing the exhaust to escape. And that allows then the core stage to drop away with the third stage already powering the Soyuz into its initial orbit. The launch vehicle control system parameters are nominal. We are standing by for GECA 2. Second stage shutdown. And standing by for that third stage ignition. And confirmation, second stage has shut down and separated. The Soyuz now being powered by that third stage engine. Copy. GECA 2 uh, command, cutoff command went through and everything is nominal on board. Copy all. Everything continuing to proceed smoothly. The core booster separating at an altitude of about 105 miles in height. It's about 170 kilometers. Now being propelled by the single engine of the third stage, it provides about 67,000 pounds of thrust and is going to burn for a little over four minutes. It will be the final phase of the rocket's journey into orbit. Third stage thrusters are operating nominally. And again, this is a view looking back towards the end, and that'll be cutting in and out. This is an animation of what's taking place right now. That third stage engine going to continue to fire and carry the vehicle into orbit. It's actually a view you're seeing one of the folded up solar arrays. Uh, that, and along with a series of antennas, will deploy shortly after the Soyuz makes its initial orbit. We're still about two and a half minutes away from the shutdown and separation of the third stage. Everything continuing to go smoothly for this ride, taking off right on time at 8.57 a.m. Central Time. Everything looking good so far with the crew. Alex Kropochka, Jessica Mir, and Haza Ali Al-Mansuri inside the spacecraft, well on their way to orbit. 400 seconds into the flight, the spacecraft is stable.
We're approaching eight minutes since liftoff. At this point, the vehicle traveling at a velocity of over uh, almost 13,500 miles an hour. We're just under a minute away from third stage shutdown and separation. We'll see the engine on the third stage cut off and separate, delivering the Soyuz spacecraft into its initial orbit. 490 seconds. The spacecraft is stable. Copy all. Everything is nominal on board, and we are feeling great. Copy. 500 seconds. Everything is nominal. Luca, three command. Got all. And getting a spectacular view there. You see the third stage separate and fly away. And Thermos, congratulations. We're handing you over to Moscow. Thermos, Moscow. Go ahead. Go ahead, Moscow. How are you feeling? We are standing by for your report on the third stage separation. Everything was nominal and we are feeling great. And we are working from pages 35 through 39. Copy all. And we are standing by for the first measurement for page 36. And just like that, three new crew members now in outer space, the third stage separating, and we did get a good report that all of the solar arrays and antennas have deployed. So a spacecraft in good health now in orbit around planet Earth. Russian cosmonaut Alex Kropochka, NASA astronaut Jess Kamir, and your United Arab Emirates astronaut Hazan Ali Al-Mansuri now in outer space and beginning their chase down of the International Space Station. Copy all. It's closed. RPV 1 and 2 flow centers are closed. Copy all. That's wonderful. And oversight of the spacecraft now going to be transferring over to the Russian Mission Control Center just outside of Moscow. It'll be this team right there in the room. And again, we did get confirmation that both solar arrays and all of the Rendezvous and docking antennas have deployed, so a spacecraft in good health, along with the crew, now ready to make the six-hour journey towards the space station. Thermos, we can see the image. And we're standing by for the first measurement for page 36 from you. Moscow, this is Sarmat. At the air, was nominal and on time. Copy. RPVs are closed. Copy. Moscow, this is Sarmat 2. I'm ready to report the first measurement. We are ready, Sarmat 2. 170805 SR pressure is two is eight two four. Bow pressure is eight uh twenty one. Eighteen decimal one nineteen 
We are building the attitude right now. Karmat, at the end of this compass, at 17.18, we will uh, discuss what we'll do during the next compass that will start at 18.29. Deactivate and activate all com assets from PK. And don't forget to send the four and VP1 command. Manual control test uh, will be performed during the next compass, that is page 45, step 1, and EKV inhibit on the same page is at 18.32.00. How copy? Copy all. Also, for your information, per page 41, satellite attitude or satellite time is 18.41 through 18 inaudible. Come again. I did not quite catch that. 17.41.18.01. That is the satellite time. 1741-1801. That is a good copy. And uh, we are standing by for the next measurement. Moscow Sarmat 2, I'm ready to report the next measurement for you. We are ready to copy. Inaudible. Delta Hadim. Savlenia PO, was in Sota Dwatsa Hadim. Bill Precious 821. Savlenia PO. Inaudible. Delta Hadim. 2547. Inaudible. Copy all. We have copied all the measurements. And uh, everything is nominal. Copy. Sarmatsu. Moscow Sarmat 1. So again, the crew now in space. You can hear them running through a, a number of different system checks on board the Soyuz. Uh, we are going to take a couple more hashtag Ask NASA questions. This one from German wanted to know, does NASA ever answer the hashtag Ask NASA questions? And I can definitively say yes, German, yes we do. Uh, our next one comes from Harvard Elementary. Uh, some fourth grade students wanted to know, what do astronauts do for entertainment while in space? Uh, it's actually much cushier now uh, to be an astronaut than it was even years ago. The astronauts have access uh, to internet while they're up there, so they also have books. They world. They'll spend a lot of time over in Russia training on the Russian systems, especially if they're going to fly on one of these Soyuz spacecraft, uh, but also in places like Japan and different countries in Europe uh, for the different systems on board the station managed by those different countries.
Uh, Mrs. Melcher's class wanted to know why is the launch in Kazakhstan and not UAE, Russia, or USA? Well, it goes back to where the former Soviet Union built all of their launch facilities. It was actually built in Kazakhstan while it was still part of that country. And uh, after that, when it became the Russian Federation, they still use all of the same infrastructure and they work with the government of Kazakhstan to use it. Uh, and that's where the Soyuz launches from. We don't currently have uh, human capable vehicles launching from the USA, but that's all about to change once our commercial crew vehicles come online from pro providers Boeing and SpaceX within the next year. So you'll be seeing more launches of people to the International Space Station from different locations than ever before. Next up, we have one from Sophia who wanted to know what memorable items are the astronauts bringing into space? Uh, it differs from each of them. They do get a small allotment typically to bring some items up with them to the International Space Station. Most of those are kept private, uh, but we do know that inside of the Soyuz spacecraft today, there was a zero-G indicator, so basically a, a small uh, a toy hung above the crew members that indicates when they're in microgravity, and it was a plush sparkly unicorn from the commander Alex Kropochka's daughter. And uh, Haza Ali Almansuri making his first trip into space uh, also was able to tell reporters that he had a small uh, plush camel from his children that he's carrying up into space as well. So they do get a small allotment, not a lot as you can imagine as it is fairly uh, difficult to pack everything into a tight space and all of the important stuff goes first. Uh, our next question comes from Eric wanted to know where along the journey do the rockets falling debris disintegrate is it upon entering the Earth's atmosphere not all of the pieces of the rockets typically disintegrate some will actually make the re-entry back down to Earth's ground that's one of the main reasons why, why the Russians chose Kazakhstan is there are very vast stretches of uninhabited land where you're not going to have to worry about those rockets coming down in anyone's backyard that's also why in America, uh, we typically launch over bodies of water uh, right now, either from the Kennedy Space Center on the coast of Florida or even from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia, as you can keep that water clear and then it's just going to fall down into the ocean. Our next one comes from Matt, who wanted to know, with the station crew about to have a crew of nine, what are the chances of a four-a-side space football game going on with the ninth acting as a referee? I would say the chances are pretty slim, but they do have some balls on board the station. I know they have a soccer ball uh, and typically have a football, so you never know sometimes what these astronauts will get up to. So stay tuned. I will say follow their social media accounts if you want to get really deep insights into what it's like to live in space. Um, all of the astronauts, most of the cosmonauts and the international crew members, like Luca Parmitano, very active on Twitter when they have some free time, bringing the entire world along for these journeys while they are up there. Our next question comes from M7 MDS91. Wanted to know, is there any future plans to increase the number of crew on Soyuz? Uh, there's no plans to increase the number of crew on Soyuz. It is a three-seater, and that's what it's going to remain. Uh, but once we start flying those commercial crew vehicles I talked about, uh, they, those hold four. So you will see a, an increase in the total size of the population on board the International Space Station from six all the way up to seven. Uh, and we're also working on finding a new permanent place for that seventh crew member to sleep once they are on board. So I know we had a lot of questions earlier about sleep quarters uh, with the nine people today. Uh, six of them will have their own sleep quarters. Three will be kind of temporarily camping out in different modules. But eventually, once we head up to seven crew members, there will be a seventh crew cabin added on board the station. Uh, our next one comes from Cassidy, who wanted to know, do they all speak the same language? Uh, on board, where, or is there a language that they speak where they can all communicate? Uh, yes, there is. Um, while they're on board the Soyuz spacecraft, they all speak Russian. So all of our crew members go through uh, some pretty intensive Russian language training along with the as international uh, astronauts riding aboard. Uh, and that's just to, um, uh, they're having to talk directly to Russian flight controllers. Uh, most of the crew members will also speak English. Uh, but there's usually a, a bevy of language spo languages spoken on board the International Space Station. Uh, the primary two are Russian and English. 
And then our last one for right now comes from Bubbles. Wanted to know how do astronauts remain fit in space? Asked by an eight-year-old. Well, eight-year-old Bubbles, uh, it comes from working out two and a half hours every single day. For now, though, we're getting a treat. We're getting some replays from that launch. Again, the Soyuz lifted off today at 8.57 a.m. Central Time. Uh, this morning at 9.57 a.m. over on the East Coast. We're actually over in the next day um, in Baikonur. Это видишь, королевский крест называется. Все четыре ступени вокруг.
Не, ну здесь не получается, потому что сколько надо брать там время, чтобы тебя там какой-то таймер не оставлять. All right, and those were all of our launch replays. Again, though, the day is not done, so be sure to continue to tune into NASA TV as they make their way to the International Space Station. Here's a quick rundown of all of our upcoming events. Starting at 11.30, all time central, we're going to have a video file, all of the post-launch views, and some post-launch interviews with people down there at Baikonur. We will be back at 2 p.m. central time for docking coverage. Docking expected at 2.45 p.m. central, 3.45 p.m. eastern, with the three crew members arriving to the station. After that, we'll break for a few hours while they do leak checks and get ready to open up the hatches coming back at 4 p.m. central time for hatch opening coverage with hatch opening itself at 4:45. at which time the three crew members will make their way on board we'll have nine people on board the international space station all of that will be wrapped up at the end of the day at 7 30 p.m. central time with a video file showing all of the docking and hatch opening activities i do want to thank you for tuning in this morning this is just step one in our journey to the international space station so be sure to come back a little bit later this afternoon as we get ready to add three new crew members to the International Space Station. For now, though, we are going to go ahead and sign off. This is Mission Control Houston. Hey, you're watching NASA TV on the air and online every day on this planet and beyond.